Welcome to Documentary First, an inside look at a documentary filmmaker's journey. I'm your host and a documentary filmmaker myself, Christian Taylor. I'm typically joined by my co-host Jason Rugg, but today he's away looking after some of his family matters. So I'll be holding down the fort on my own. Hopefully we'll be fine. Jason, we miss you and we look forward to seeing you back soon. So I uh, hope your family feels better and uh, yeah, we miss you. Uh, today, I am so excited because we are joined by uh, a producer and an editor of a film that I hope everybody gets a chance to see uh, called I Fine, uh, in parentheses, Beauty. Uh, it's a short, a 30-minute short that um, for me was eye-opening, and I really do hope that you get to see it. So we're joined by Alex Ivany, and I just want to say, Alex, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's really nice to meet you. Yeah, thank you, Christian. It's great to meet you. And I just wanted to say how, how excited I am to have a podcast that's not just dedicated to documentaries, but also you had Ken Burns on the show recently. And yeah. he's one of my heroes. My, you know, I grew up watching him and that's kind of how I got into documentaries. And I know you share a similar, similar story. Um, so, so true. Thanks so much for having me, and I'm honored to be be on the same show that Ken Burns was on. <laughs> well, I was just blown away that he was even here, too. It's just so amazing to talk to him in person, but that's the way I feel about you. You know, I look at your work, and I think, oh, my goodness, he's coming on, taking time to talk with us. I'm really honored. So let me read your bio real quick just so people know a little bit more about you. Okay, Alex is an, ed- is an editor with a diverse portfolio of credits, including Academy Award nominated and Peabody winning Netflix documentary 13th, directed by Ava DuVernay. Ivany, Alex Ivany has found growth and healing in his work, which you will be able to see um, when we talk about this little feel I, uh, film I find, uh, which has predominantly been focused on topics of racial justice and social issues. He has worked as an editor for the award-winning television series Queen Sugar, which centers on the lives of Black American family in rural Louisiana. Ivany was featured in Cine Montage Magazine, the Editor's Guild official magazine, for his work on the show. In addition to Queen Sugar, Ivany has worked on several projects produced by award-winning filmmaker Ava DuVernay, including the anthology series Cherish the Day, as well as Beyonce's Family Feud music video feature featuring video featuring Jay-Z and a short film for the Smithsonian Museum titled August 28th, A Day in the Life of People, starring Don Cheadle, Regina King, and Angela Bassett. Ivany is a member of the Editors Guild and the Emmy Television Academy. Wow. That's a lot of work in a very short time. You look very young to me. If people are watching on video, uh, you don't look old enough to have all of those credits or that life experience. So tell me how this all started. Like, give me a little bit about who Alex is and how you got into this business and, uh, you know, how we got to this moment. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. I'm, I'm for the record, I'm 32. So I'm I'm young, but I <laughs> you are. I have a bit of a young, young-looking face, anyways. Um, but yeah, I've always just been really interested in documentaries and filmmaking. Like I mentioned, Ken Burns. Um, I didn't have cable growing up. Uh, I had a single mom, and she was a, a working single mom. So it was kind of like, what do you do with this kid when you know you're trying to get work done? put on Ken Burns from the library and I would just sit there. I watched the baseball series, the jazz series multiple times. Um, so just had, you know, this sort of foundation of documentary and art. My mom was a photographer too. So I had mm. art kind of all around me. Um, and then, you know, I started picking up a camcorder when I was a teenager, just the little DV tapes and started filming stuff. Um, and then when I was in high school, I actually was lucky enough to have like a film production class, which is kind of kind of rare for high schools. I feel like. Yeah. Um, Where did you grow up? Where great, was this? I, I grew up in Santa Cruz in Northern California. Okay. okay. Yeah. So it's it's near San Francisco. It's uh, not a big city. It's a, a town by the beach. So really beautiful town. Um, and so, yeah, I had an opportunity to start picking up a camcorder and filming stuff. And I did a, uh, a short documentary for the class about um, the United Farm Workers. And 
which was founded by Cesar Chavez, um, because I was just curious, you know, there's growing up around so many migrant farm workers, just about their lives and, you know, how they're, how they're able to survive and organize. Um, and so I delved into that. I was only like 16 and just filmed this, this documentary that ended up getting into actually a few festivals and wow. doing, doing pretty well. And it kind of, um, it helped me get into film school. Uh, that, okay. that project helped me get into film school. So I ended up going to Chapman, Chapman University in Orange County. Um, and I did the, one of the only uh, documentary majors in the country, actually. There's, there's a lot of film schools, but there's very few with a specific documentary major. Um, I didn't even know that. I mean, that's good to know. Yeah. I'm so glad you're telling us this on this podcast. Uh, there is a college called Chapman in California that is focused on documentary filmmaking. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, exactly. If you're interested in documentary filmmaking, which I assume a lot of your listeners and watchers are, um, and, you know, if you're looking to go to film school and study that sort of thing, Chapman's a great one. I had, uh, you know, a couple of great professors, Sally Rubin and Jeff Swimmer, who kind of gave me this, you know, foundation, and we were really studied these documentaries from all across the century, and, um, you know, from Nanook of the North to more recent things. Um, and yeah, I had an opportunity there to make a couple of documentaries that, uh, you know, did f had little festival runs and, and did, uh, you know, quite well for student films. And so that kind of launched my career into, you know, working on these, these internships and things like that, um, that were documentary related. Um, but then I kind of ended up, I had a internship actually on a, a studio at 20th Century Fox. Um, so I ended up kind of out, you know, getting out of documentaries for a little bit. And I had this studio job and I wasn't loving it. You know, it was very, um, sort of corporate. It wasn't too creative. Uh, you know, I wasn't having a lot of opportunity to, to do what I loved. And I was just, you know, searching for jobs and, one day I was on Facebook and saw this post from someone who I had met at a, a networking meetup and it was a job for a documentary as an assistant editor. And I was like, Oh, this is interesting. Uh, you know, I would love to work on a documentary. Um, and it ended up being 13th. So this, yeah, just this little Facebook post that I responded to turned into something that kind of, you know, catapulted my, my career because obviously 13th ended up on Netflix and um, was nominated for an Oscar and is, you know, shown in schools and is used as an educational tool. So that really was the foundation for my career as an editor um, and, you know, getting into documentaries and, and all of that. Yeah. Yeah. That's just a wonderful story because really, you know, you're a guy that picked up a camcorder and was interested in filming stuff and, you know, answered a Facebook post. And now here we are. Uh, it is really the little things, you know, it's a desire to, um, to do something and to say, I'm going to do it. I don't know what I'm doing or how to do it. Uh, I'm just going to do it and pursue, uh, that passionately and, that networking piece of meeting people and um, helping other people on their projects that I've always found is the way sort of into, um, you know, the field that you want to be in. So I congratulate you for that. And I hope our listeners that are trying to, to get their feet on the ground will look at that example. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, definitely. Networking is so important. Don't be afraid to to bother people a little bit and reach out to them and, um, you know, go to events. I'm, I'm in LA, so it's a little bit easier to mm -hmm. find networking events than a lot of places, but, um, you know, people are, are really receptive to just having you reach out to them and ask questions a lot. Yeah. And you said you found, you know, something on Facebook. I know there are 
I started by with a meetup group. There's actually an online community uh, that does meetup groups and you meet each other online, but then you can meet in you know person. And so that's an art, artist group in Chicago that I started with. Uh, and then there are organizations in just about every town and there are film communities. Every state has a film office. And so people can look at their film office and the film office will tell you, you know, what things are around or, what events you can go to. Uh, and, you know, there are all sorts of associations and things. Women in Film is a national organization that you can join. So, um, you know, absolutely look at Facebook, uh, look online, just pursue your passion and you can find it. The one thing I'm curious about is in high school, you said you started entering these film festivals and I found filmmaking a very challenging thing because of the money involved. And of course, not knowing how to navigate the waters of, um, you know, the whole system. So how, as a young person, did you afford to do the things that you did? And how did you end up figuring out, okay, I'm going to put it in film festivals and talk to me a little bit about how you found your way. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question because it's always about access, right? Like Mm -hmm. you can have a certain amount of access to it. Um, that'll help you get into it. And I, I was, lucky enough to have um a really supportive mom you know she, I, it was it was just her and i uh i didn't grow up with my dad but um you know she she would get these camcorders all throughout my childhood uh and we didn't have a ton of money so she would get them for a month at a time film some stuff and then return them and then we <laughs> finally you know when <laughs> when I've i was heard a of teenager we finally yeah yeah so when I was a teenager, we finally had one permanently and it was like just sitting there in the drawer. So um, it was the perfect opportunity to to do that. And, um, you know, I've noticed now, now more and more throughout time, there's more access. Now we have phones, so it's a little easier to just kind of shoot these these amateur films. I say amateur because it's, you know, you're just starting out, but they can still be really good quality, even if you're shooting mm -hmm. on a phone um, and still learning. So yeah, I was just, to answer your question, I just happened to have that opportunity to have the camcorder available and a mom who was excited to support my passion. Um, and, you know, financially, I think the film festivals were a little cheaper because I was a student so I probably mm, got some that's true. discounted. There is always a student discount when you enter. That's yeah. true. I forgot about that. Everybody should look yeah. for that when you're entering. Right, right. And they were local festivals, so it wasn't like extremely difficult to get into at the time. Um, but then moving forward to film school, actually, Chapman has uh, an amazing program in that um, they also have a festival department. So they have a budget allotted for uh, wow. submitting students films that they think will do well in festivals to festivals. So um, I didn't, and I got great, I got great financial aid at Chapman. So, you know, if you're, if for someone who's looking to go to film school, I would say, you know, don't think you can't do it because of money or, or something like that, because um, some of these schools give really good financial aid and are, really supportive and just just looking for bright young talent that's beautiful tell me then the most um i would say defining moment uh when you feel like um this has become who you are you are a documentary editor documentary editor you are a documentary producer you're no no, no longer now chasing this dream you are working in this thing that you dreamed about uh, when did you sort of make that transition? Well, I, I feel in a way that I'm still making that transition, right? Because it's been, um, it's been sort of a, a process of being an editor on different mediums. I've done documentaries, I've done indie films, indie feature films, and I've done some some narrative TV. So I've been kind of discovering these different mediums and figuring out, you know um how i enjoy them as an editor and um 
just recently with I Find, I had the opportunity to to be a producer on that. So uh, that was a you know a complete learning experience. I kind of had to learn on the go, um, and it's it's still a learning experience. Um, and even you know even with the film finished, it, the producing part of it Doesn't never stop. stops. It does yeah, not stop. So, that is so true. Yeah. Yeah. That's so, so true. you know, as, as an editor, I'm used to just working this allotted amount of time and we picture lock and I might be involved in some of the posts in terms of color and sound and those sort of things. But then the film goes to the world and I, I'm done. Um, right. But yeah, it's, it's really different being a producer, um, <laughs> a lot more hands on. <laughs> And That's so true. You wear a lot of hats for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I think when I say you've made it or you've arrived, there is a difference between doing this as a hobby and making a living doing this. And I would assume now you are being you are able to support yourself on your work. Is that true? Right. Yeah. 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 Then you've arrived. <laughs> yeah. You you've made it uh farther than most of us. Um so congratulations to you about that and uh that is a significant milestone I think to go from um a lot of people when they start out or doing their day job and you know my day job is being a voice actor and so I do that work and that work goes into making my films uh actually. So uh, I've not yet arrived to the place where you are. Hopefully one day I will. Uh, but talk to us about when you made that jump, when you left from being able, you know, scrapping to figure out how you're going to survive to being able to pay yourself and, um, you know, make a living doing the film work. Yeah. You mean more so as an editor or. How, however you make your money. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, I guess it was, I mean, it's a, it's kind of a trickle effect. So I started as an assistant editor. Um, and I, I kind of always feel like I started out with a bang because my first job, real job as an assistant editor was 13th. Yeah. So that was just un, unreal. And, um, I had a chance to learn from Ava DuVernay and also the editor who I worked with, Spencer Averick, who is, just an amazing person and an amazing mentor for me. And he kind of has taken me under his wings um, throughout the years. And he, you know, he brought me along as, as his assistant editor on several different projects. And I just had an amazing opportunity to learn from him. Um, so I was making money as an assistant editor and able to support myself doing that. And, you know, a lot of people stay as assistant editors and they love it. And I, Mm -hmm. I totally respect that. Um, but I wanted to edit. I really wanted to edit. Um, I felt, you know, it was a lot of collaboration and creativity involved in editing. Um, and so I guess the moment that I feel like I made it, um, was, uh, editing Queen Sh or not Queen Sugar, actually, uh, Cherish the Day, which was the first, it was my first time as a union editor on any sort of large production show. Um, I had been assistant editing, like I said, and Ava brought me in to her office and she was like, are you, are you, I have this new show. Are you ready to edit it? And I was like, just, you know, my world kind of changed in that moment. Um, because not only was I jumping into the edit chair, but also, you know, it was a union job and it was just, health insurance and all that. So it's like, okay, I'm, I'm secure. I'm feeling, I'm feeling all right about where I'm at right now. Um, and then, but yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a difference between sort of making it in terms of being able to support yourself and making it in terms of being able, able to tell the stories you want to tell. Um, oh, yeah. and I think as, as artists and filmmakers, we're always like, just never satisfied, I think, in a way, just yeah. kind of like we finished that one project and that we're passionate about. And we're like, what, you know, what other things do I want to say? Um, so, yeah, it's, yeah, you almost feel like you never make it. <laughs> 
That, that's so true. I'm sure if we talked to somebody at the top of their game, Ken Burns probably, that would be crazy. I can't imagine him saying that, but there's probably stuff that he still wants to do all the time. You're right. There is a difference yeah. between, you know, making it to support yourself and making it, uh, telling the stories that you want to tell. It looks like you are starting to do that now, uh, with I Fine. I think that, um, I see a lot of your fingerprints all over this, uh, being the producer and the editor. It is a smaller, uh, crew. It looks like it was a passion project. Um, and you know, we have talked to several editors on our show, so I'd like to focus on your producing actually. Um, it is a new position for you. You were learning on the go. So I'd like to ask you about that before we get into that. Let's talk a little bit about the film. Tell us what I find is, um, and you know, it is, uh, in my mind, sort of a black experience, social justice. Um, it falls into your passion. Um, so I, I love that. So start by telling us how you got into you know, these films that you were super passionate about, um, what led you in that direction, and then how uh, I Find was born out of that. Yeah, yeah. So I, I would say that I've always been more or less really passionate about um, just social justice issues and things like that. I, a lot of my family was very politically active and um vocal about those sort of things growing up. So I kind of had that foundation. But um, then when I worked on 13th, it was, you know, just an eye opener for me as, as a human being, and also as um, a biracial person who my, my dad is black, and I didn't really get to know that side, um, and get to understand the true, you know, the history of black people in this country. And um, it was just an eye opener to me to research it and go through all of those archives. There's, it's a heavy archival footage documentary. So I was seeing a lot of, a lot of footage that was hard to watch. Um, and it, you know, made me angry and sad and all kinds of emotions. And it just kind of, it just kind of stirred up this thing inside of me that, um, just really wanted to, tell these stories, not just because they're important, but because I didn't, you know, I, I felt almost betrayed that I didn't know the full extent of this history. Um, and I just think documentaries are such, such a powerful tool for that. Um, film in general, I think is, but documentaries specifically, cause they're kind of combining all these elements of history, journalism, anthropology, um, you know, you're using different sciences in a way to create this art. Form. Sure. Um, so that was kind of the, the fire that went off, I, I'd like to say. And then um, ever since then, I've, you know, sort of pursued those types of projects. And anytime I have the opportunity to meet, you know, another filmmaker who's working in that, that area. Um, and, and, you know, it's not just, uh, social justice and racial justice i think it's just any story that is um of people who are either marginalized or underrepresented in in media um you know i recently did worked on a documentary that's disability related um so it's you know it's just i just love telling stories that are eye opening to people and you know help help people not feel like they're in the dark like i kind of felt like at that certain moment in time well you actually absolutely succeeded with i find because when i watched this i felt the same way i was like how do i not know this it is so shocking uh that i was blind to what was going on and let's let's just talk about that a little bit um tell us how you fell into doing this project and uh tell us what it's about Give us the long line yeah. and dive in that way. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You might hear my cat outside scratching at the door. Mine too. Angrily. Mine too. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyways, so I find is about beauty um, at its core. It's it's in the form. It tells the story of these uh, kids and teenagers in Sierra Leone who are using skin bleaching products to lighten their skins. Um, 
uh, for, you know, and it, it touches on their stories, but also why they do this, which is the sort of ingrained colonialism, um, that we have in, in our society, um, colonialistic aspect of beauty. Um, and how this film came about was it, I guess it started, I guess I'll jump back a couple of years, uh, to meeting the, one of the directors, there's two directors. Um, but I worked with, uh, Adisa Sapturi, uh, who is, he directed, um, a feature a few years, maybe five or six years ago called Skin in the Game, uh, which I edited. And that was my, the first feature that I edited. It was his first feature that he directed. Um, okay. so we just, you know, we bonded and became close over the, the experience and, um, stayed in touch throughout the years. And, uh, he has a philanthropy in Sierra Leone, um, where he's, you know, teaching different arts and, um, they have a theater program and an arts program. And, uh, so he had been going back and forth to Sierra Leone. And, um, one thing he had, he had developed is a play or he had asked the kids if they wanted to do a play. And, uh, they said, yeah, they wanted to do a play. And the topic they decided to do was about skin bleaching, which was really affecting a lot of them, whether it was them skin bleaching or family members. Um, and these were just kids and teenagers in Sierra Leone. Um, and so originally the idea was to do a documentary about this play. So he, he went out there and started filming some pre-interviews. And then he got in touch with me um, about editing it, actually. Uh, and, you know, it was, it was one of those things, like you said, a labor of love, um, passion project where there wasn't a ton of budget. It was independent. Um, and he told me about the topic. And I was, I, you know, like you're expressing, I was totally shocked. Like I had never really known anything about this and um it's something you know we all struggle with beauty standards and uh you know what what is beauty that's that's the real question what is beauty um and that's what this documentary was exploring is you know what makes you beautiful is it just a certain skin tone and it's not um so I came on board as editor. Um, but like I said, it was low budget. So he, you know, he asked, can you do this? Um, with, for this, this budget, it's, it's, I'm sorry, you know, we don't have more. And I was like, Adisa and Ebony was Ebony Gilbert is the co-director. Um, you know, I love the project. I just, I just really want to be a part of it. And not, not only do I want to edit it, but like, I want to just help you make this whole, this whole film happen and use my knowledge in post-production as an editor to help get it to the finish line. Um, and they were, they were really excited. And so, you know, I hopped on board as editor producer, which, um, it was a new, a new hat for me. I'm, I'm just used to the editor side of things. So the producing came in, it was a lot of, um, it was a lot of finding the team, uh, we had an amazing composer, uh, Rashai, who's extremely talented. Um, our, our colorist, Adrian Delude, um, amazing colorist and our sound guy, Scott, uh, Scott, um, I'm blanking on his last name right now, but, uh, we, you know, we just kind of put together this amazing team. And so, you know, we had these, this, uh, process in the editing where we would, um, do test it. We would have test screenings and get feedback and notes. So we organized these test screenings that, that were just amazing because after each test screening, it would just spark so much discussion, hours of discussion, um, from so many perspectives and experiences. So it was, it was really gratifying to see that it was already sparking discussion and kind of helped us, you know, formulate the story. So Yeah. 
it, it, you know, it struck me that it wasn't just about beauty. It was also about identity, identity, longing, acceptance, love, all wrapped up or, or tied to the color of our skin. And it really broke my heart. Um, it was also interesting because it convicted me. I have been to tanning salons. I have used tanning creams. How crazy is that, that here we are as white people trying to make ourselves brown and you have brown people that are trying to make themselves white. And there's something really not right about that. Um, and I was convicted about that myself as I uh, looked at the bigger picture, you know, from someone on the outside of, you know, this situation in Sierra Leone. Um, so I think, you know, it was a, a beautiful, a beautiful thing to address. Um, I'm sure it can't be easy to produce. You are talking about, uh, you know, a different country, a different language. Uh, there are so many things involved in this filming. As a producer, you know, what kind of producer were you? What did your job entail? What were the successes and what were the challenges? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's there's definitely different types of producers. There's, I mean, there's line producers who are dealing more with budget and all of that. I definitely wasn't that type of producer. <laughs> Me either. <laughs> Me either. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe on a different project I'll be, but um, for this one in particular, I was more of a creative producer, um, helping formulate the story and, um, you know, really have discussions about it with the, the directors. And then, um, you know, a lot of it in a way was post-producing, uh, you know, giving, because mo a lot of projects I have, an assistant editor on and a post producer. Mm. So it's more of a infrastructure, more of a team for uh, the post, you know, the post workflow. So for this one, it was just me. I was, you know, delivering to the sound and color teams and doing sort of the assistant editor work while also doing sort of the post producer work, um, which is, you know, communicating between them and figuring out the deliverable deliverables so there was a creative storytelling aspect to the producing but there was also a very technical aspect to the producing and then um and then also just you know delivering to festivals and dcps and things like that where it's you know it just comes under the wheelhouse of my knowledge as an editor that it was kind of natural for me to to help with all of those things and I, you know, help, help Adisa and Ebony get it to the finish line. Um, so yeah. there was a lot of that. I, yeah. I can't tell you how many times I feel absolutely horrible for going back to Bill Evil, my editor and saying, I need this kind of file or can you make me this or what would it look like if we exported this way? Uh, and I, it's true. If you had that dual skill of being able to uh, kind of post produce plus deliver as an editor, it does make things easier um, and less expensive. But on that person, it's a big load to carry for both of those things for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's a huge cost cutter. And then also in, you know, also once the film is finished, you know, with marketing and things like that, um, it's it helps that I'm kind of able to cut a trailer and some. We've right. Put, we've done some marketing videos and some graphics and things like that. That you know, normally when you're just an editor on a project, it's like it's done. My work is done. Don't ask me to do that yeah. sort of stuff. But when you're when it's, it feels like it's your, you know, your project also, um, you are passionate to do all that and you're kind of put, you know, getting a head start on certain things like that. Um, and then, yeah, just self promotion of the film and, um, because it still isn't, we, we actually are nominated for a NAACP award recently. So we're really honored. Congratulations. That, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. But it's still actually not 
even available to the public or distributed. So that's a struggle that in and of itself, where it's like finding the proper distribution to um, get it to the world, because that's that's ultimately the goal is you want the world to see it. Absolutely. Well, um, let's talk about where you are in the life cycle of this film. And for those that are new, there is a life cycle. Um, you know, there is research and development, pre-production, principal, then there's post-production. Then there is the film festival circuit, if you choose to do that, uh, or the distribution. And typically after, you know, the film festival run can last about a year to 18 months, and then your film is released and it uh, is out there for about a year before it becomes old. And so talk to us about the life cycle of your film and where you are right now. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, we're kind of at that phase where we're looking to to get it out to the world. We've done uh, the festival circuit. We, had, we premiered at um, Santa Barbara International Film Festival uh, last February. So it's been almost yeah it's been a year um so it's you know it's time we had a lot of great festival experiences um, how did you do and tell me some of your favorites we like promoting festivals here yeah definitely i i mean santa barbara was great um we did i one of my favorite festivals is uh pan africa film festival okay which is here in la actually um and it's it's an amazing experience. The The audience is so engaged and um, yeah, we, it, it helps that we won some awards at that festival too. So that made the experience sure. a little bit nicer. Um, but yeah, I, I love that festival and uh, Beverly Hills was really nice too. Uh, they were great for us. Um, it's, it's been extremely well received in, a lot of black film, specifically black film festivals all throughout the country. Um, and we had a, a chance to take it back to, to Africa, back to Sierra Leone. Uh, there was a film festival there that we won an award at. So we, we had a chance <laughs> to, to screen it for the, the characters who are in the, in the film and some of the crew, um, a lot of the crew actually was, was based in Sierra Leone. So we had a chance to do that. Um, and then it's, it's won some, some human rights awards. Uh, um, and it was also nominated for a African Academy award. Um, wow. so yeah, so it's, it's done quite well. We're really excited about, you know, how it's been received and the audiences that have seen it have really loved it. Um, so we're, we're ready to get it to the, the world, you know, cause there's kind of that, that festival going audience that's very niche filmmaker, you right. know, lovers, but, um, the goal is to get it to, to a large, a wider array of eyes. Yes. Is there anywhere people can watch it now or see a trailer? Uh, yeah, the trailer is on Vimeo. Uh, that, that is public. If you search, I find beauty on Vimeo. I think it's on YouTube also. And then the and you spell I find I F I N E just like it sounds. And then beauty, right. of course. So right. that's how you'd search it. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, the film actually is not available yet. We hope, we hope to get it out. Um, we just, we have a private screener. So if anyone watching this or listening to it is interested, then you can, you know, reach out to me. Um, and I'll send you a screener. So, or you can reach out to me too, and I can, I can put you in touch. Uh, tell us about your socials. Where can people find you and interact with you? Yeah, I'm on Instagram. Uh, you can just search my name, Alex Ivany, or my app is Ivany Avenue, um, <laughs> Ivany underscore Avenue. Um, and then I don't, I don't know. I mean, I could, I could give, you can list my email and the, I don't know if there's a notes section or anything. Yeah, we'll like put that. a notes section. Beautiful. We'll do that. Okay, great. Now, yeah. I'm super curious. How did the uh, cast members in Sierra Leone receive the film? What, uh, what did they think? Well, they loved it. I mean, they, they felt like 
celebrities um and they were honored just to to see themselves on the the big screen like that um and we hope to bring them out here to the US at some point soon to to screen it here and have a big a big party for it um but yeah i think they loved it and we're we're really incredibly fortunate for them because this film wouldn't have been what it is without them obviously um you know your characters are are your characters but not only that is they just poured their hearts out to us and they really um they were open and really vulnerable and you know i think it it's because it was a, such a small team and you know adisa like i said already had ties to the community it kind of gave this this openness where it, it was just, there was just so much access and they were so um willing to share whereas if it was a big you know a big crew big documentary crew it just would have been so intimidating and the story just it it wouldn't have been the same um so you know we're we're so grateful for for those kids and teenagers and um you know we still stay in touch we have a whatsapp group text and you know <laughs> awesome. yeah did any of them decide to stop bleaching that's a great question um i i know that one of them for sure has i don't know what the status is on her now um i know that i know that one of the girls is bleaching more actually um and why you know, uh you know it's it's difficult there because the you know now it's like um we think as i guess in america here we think of africa as being like there's you know they have no communication to the rest of the world but they really do they have cell phones they have access to what the public you know sees in magazines and advertisements so they see the same things we see um which is this this beauty standard uh which is constantly changing i mean i think it's changed in my lifetime and it continues to change but um but it's just in in their faces so to have that power to say you know i am beautiful which is what we're trying to uh, enunciate in this film is you know you are beautiful um it's really difficult for some of them you know with yeah. with all of those influences um mm. and you can definitely notice you know changes in their skin tone and and damages to the skin and the skin becomes more translucent and then um you know without giving away the film there are some things in there that are you know specific to that and shocking i will say for yeah. sure um all right we're going to wrap it up here quickly but before we go i would wonder if you could give us let's say three tips uh for new listeners new filmmakers think about three things if a young filmmaker was to come to you and say how can i quote unquote make it how can i you know do this as a living what are your three tips yeah yeah so i mean the one i always always give um specifically for you know if you're starting out and uh it works especially well if you're on the the younger side and people kind of view you on the younger side it's just <laughs> asking questions a lot um people are really open to to young up and comers asking questions um they they actually feel good about it that they have something to give knowledge wise um and so it's it's actually i find it's really hard to bother people with questions about their career or how you know things that will benefit you um and yeah so i just when i was starting out i was asking all the questions i could to everyone who was more experienced than me which was everyone um <laughs> <laughs> and then uh you know i guess i guess another one is 
I mean, there's there's the ten thousand hours thing. We always hear about that, but it's tell like, me about that. Oh, I actually you know, haven't heard that. Oh, oh, really? Well, yeah. just putting in the ten thousand hours of practice on your craft, um, you know, gives you that that sort of experience to be good at it. They they say, um, but I I feel while that's true, I think that's kind of um, overwhelming. You know, making it small. No, no I, well, yeah, overwhelming, but it's kind of making something smaller because not everyone has access to even start the thing in the beginning, in the first place, you know, sort of what we talked about earlier. Um, so I guess I think my advice is would always kind of be personalized to the specific person starting out and how much access they have because – it's like if if you have access to filmmaking tools and things like that, then yeah, I'll just go and do it and make mistakes. Um, but if you don't, you know, you have to be a little more creative, unfortunately, with how you're going to get that access. So um, I can't really say if there's, you know, I can't give kind of across the board sure, generalized sure. I understand. advice. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. All right. Well, that's two already. So do you have one more? I can think of one more that we talked about. We can kind of sum up. Uh, and that was networking. That's what you said, you yeah. know, networking. Yeah. And uh, that's another really huge one. And along, and along with, with that, that I w- yeah, go sorry, ahead. I was just going to add um, having a great mentor, you know, that oh, to, yeah. to look out for you and, and have your back and teach you things is similar to the networking, but having yeah, a great it's, mentor it's invaluable. is invaluable. Really yeah, yeah, invaluable. Yeah. And I will say to uh, add to all of this, I think the way that you get there is oftentimes just getting involved and helping other people. Um, in my experience, there have been lots of people that volunteered to help make the girl who wore freedom, who were volunteering to make the second film, Heroes of Carenton. Uh, and they come here and we give them the opportunity to uh, practice whatever craft they're interested in so that they can walk away from this project having, you know, accomplished something and, you know, gained a skill and work product. And we weren't mm-hmm. able to pay them, but we were able to give them that kind of experience, that kind of uh, the stuff to put on their resume. So volunteering is a very important, I think, uh, way to network, help, help other people learn, make connections in the industry. Um, so that's another one I would throw in there. Right. Yeah, no, that's a great one. And listen to this podcast too. Yes. And Ed- listen to education. this podcast. Yeah. Your, <laughs> education, your education is never done. Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 so true. It's, it's great well, that you have this podcast and, you know, bring amazing people on like Ken Burns and lots of talented yeah. other people. Well, so. I'm going to say you too. One of the things that I love is that, um, we haven't had enough. Uh, people on here t- who are focused on social justice and the black experience. And um, I grew up in rural South Mississippi uh, where the black experience was a nightmare. And um, I am embarrassed to be part of that community and really desire to have that exposed and um, for people to, to learn what that experience is like. I just think we, we don't know enough and we still haven't learned um, in order to change things and to make a difference. So thank you for your voice, for what you're doing, for the stories that you're telling. I applaud you and um, we look forward to promoting your film and seeing where it goes. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Alex, it is now time for our special series, DocuView Deja Vu, where we ask you to bring a documentary to recommend Uh, Talk to me about uh, one or two documentaries that you were really passionate about that you want others to know about. Yeah, yeah. I have a couple I'm going to give. One was done, uh, I think, a little over 10 years ago. um, And you may have seen it. It's called Searching for Sugarman. Um, I haven't seen that. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm not sure if it's available streaming. I think it might be on Apple Plus. But it's an amazing documentary that is sort of done in the form of a mystery um, hmm. about this, about this musician who has, I'll just say has all sorts of rumors surrounding his death, his death, 
Uh, and I'm hmm. doing air quotes if you're yeah. not watching. Um, and then his music and how it kind of traveled the world and became famous in South Africa when it wasn't famous here in the USA. And then hmm. two fans, two super fans who are uh, uncovering this story. This So it's sort of told in the form of a mystery and it's beautifully edited, beautifully shot. Um, just all the crafts are exquisite and then just the storytelling style is is just amazing how it's kind of like you're learning things around each corner um so i that sounds awesome would highly recommend that one and then the do you know where you one, can find it i think it's on apple plus i'm not positive okay. about that you might be able to look on Amazon Prime. Maybe it's a rental or something like that. We'll find um, it and put it in the show. Yeah, notes. you might have to okay. investigate a little bit. <laughs> so um, tell me your second one. The other one, it just came out recently. It's actually nominated for an Oscar in the short documentary category. Mm. Um, it's called The Last Repair Shop. And um, this is a beautiful 40 minute documentary about this repair shop and the workers there um, repairing these instruments uh, for, mm. for students. It's the last repair shop in, I think, California or Los Angeles, but really at its heart, it's a story about people repairing themselves told mm. through, you know, the repairs of these instruments in this shop. And it's just so beautifully told um and that's available on youtube i'm pretty sure it's uh it's a new york times or no it's not new york times it's it's actually available on netflix it's either netflix or youtube it's definitely available uh, on we'll one link of it up and we'll put the yeah. link in the show notes awesome. great thank you so much for that okay well my uh recommendation is going to be the trial of adolf eichmann this is not a heartwarming film, I have to tell you. It is hard to watch, but it is important to watch. Um, the director is Michael Prezen or Mikael Prezen. Uh, he wrote it also. It stars David Brinkley, Edward Eis uh, Asner, Brian Bedford, um, and you can see it on Netflix. It is actual trial footage, uh, and it's just very, very emotional because it is held in Israel. And it gives the victims the opportunity to confront Adolf Eichmann. Uh, it is, there's nothing to replace watching history with your own eyes and making your own determinations about what you see and think and feel. And that's why I recommend this film. I was just like your film, Alex. I was completely shocked by the things that I learned, even though I've heard the, the Jewish Holocaust horror story uh, so many times, there's still always more to learn that just blows your mind about man's inhumanity to man. And I think it's important to remind ourselves, um, you know, how we as humans can get there if we don't watch uh, ourselves and we don't focus on being kind to people. So uh, The Trial of Adolf Eichmann, you can find that on Netflix. So that's my yeah. recommendation for today. I'm going to have to check that out. Wow. That's, yeah, that sounds really interesting. And it's yeah, interesting, have... but... Hard to watch. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. I have um, uh, a, a lot of my mom's, my family, my mom's, on my mom's side are Holocaust survivors, and I have some, mm. some uh, tapes, some footage, um, both from other foundations and some that I filmed when I was a teenager of, of them that I hope to turn to a documentary someday. So, um, yeah, that, I definitely want to watch that and, and study that one. That sounds really interesting. And uh, I'm volunteering to help you on that project. I would love that. Oh, okay. <laughs> that would I love be amazing. It. That's great. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. And yeah, if you have any projects you're working on, you know, let me know, and you know, we can we can collaborate. Yeah, networking, baby. Gotta love it. Yeah, networking. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to ask you to hold on because we want to do something special for our Patreon audience. So I've got a question to ask you. And uh, if you'll stick around for a few more minutes, we'll give them something special. Yeah. Well, everybody, we really um, love having you here. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, please do follow us on social media uh, at Documentary First. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, 
TikTok. Apparently, a lot of people have been following us on TikTok. We are putting up history stories, but we do also share um, these podcasts and clips from the podcast. And if you're up for it, join us on Patreon. We are starting a small little community of people who believe in the filmmaking that we are doing. We really value your support. Uh, Right now, we're running on fumes and a lot of volunteer work. So uh, having people join our mission is vitally important. So thank you for listening to Documentary First where we believe everyone has a story to tell and you can be the one to tell it. Bye, everybody.